Thank you so much, Vidya. What, what Vidya didn't uh, mention was her own involvement and, and how much we worked together on many of these acquisitions as well, um, pouring through uh, potential uh, collections for, for, for the museum and uh, what we've worked together uh, has been really through, through the years. So I, I really like to, to thank Vidya as well for um, all her contributions and how we've worked together through, through all this. And uh, the things that you get to see today um, will uh, be just a small part of that but um, for as, as Vidya mentioned those of you who have uh, uh, visited the exhibition in Old New World that's just next door uh, to us on in the basement uh, you might find some of uh, these images and some of these uh, artifacts uh, a bit more familiar, um, but I hope uh, whether you've been to the exhibition or not, um, these would be of, of some interest to you. And uh, first up, I'd like to thank everyone for, for making the time this evening. Uh, I, I, it, it wasn't something that we uh, noted at the start, but I, I realized there were quite a few different uh, offerings tonight and different uh, programs uh, for, for people to go to. So um, thank you for making this your choice. And uh, I, I thought I'll just head straight into it as well. Um, as you can see from the title, Imagining the, the East Indies, what, what is the East Indies? What, what was the East Indies? Um, um, in, in the exhibition itself, we, uh, that was an exhibition that was uh, put together in commemoration of the 200th uh, anniversary of the establishment of a British East India Company trading settlement in Singapore in 1819. And what we, what we sought to do with, with that exhibition was to, to, to look at the bigger story uh, leading up to that, uh, to that point of 1819. Uh, and in doing so, we, we decided to, to cast the net a little bit wider, to not just look at Singapore on its own um, as the, the island state uh, that we are so familiar with and as we know today uh, but but really to 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 consider its position in that larger region and what do you call that larger region it, it went by it went by very many names uh, but one uh, name that that seems to recur is, is this idea of the East Indies and and today I'll, I'll bring you through um, the the construction of the East Indies that's something that was never quite uh, solidified in a way uh, but but it was very much shaped by by commercial interest and and by certain European imaginations uh, of of the exotic of the Far East so so a lot of the things that we will see today have to do, have to do with with that uh, imagination and hence the title that we have so I'm I'm going to take us through a few things I'm going to start by looking at the mapping of the East Indies, the way in which um, the, the region was, was mapped um, and, and how that reflects, like I mentioned to you, uh, some of the, the commercial and political interests of the people producing these maps, uh, how revealing that is. And maps not just as, as geographical uh, uh, documents on their own, but, but as texts that you can read as, as, as visual texts um, with, with uh, that um, text that are uh, rich with, with symbols and things for us to decode. So we'll, we'll start with maps. Uh, we will then proceed to look at travel literature and in particular uh, illustrated travel literature and how um, that played a big part in this imagining of the, the, the East Indies. Um, we'll, we'll go on to, uh, to look at this idea of the picturesque the uh, kind of artistic uh, vocabulary, language, um, and idiom uh, that, that framed the way uh, people consumed um, and, and produced uh, artwork um, around the East Indies and how the East Indies uh, was then framed uh, within that. Um, yes? Oh, okay. Uh, how, how that was, no worries. I'll just wave back to you anyway. Hello. Um, how, how the East Indies was, was framed uh, within that pictorial language. And, and lastly, I'll extend that, um, uh, that discussion to Singapore um, and how some early representations of Singapore um, also carried on uh, that, uh, that legacy, uh, but, but changed things in a slightly different way. So let's start off with the mapping of the, of the East Indies. Um, you, you have here uh, one of the very early uh, attempts at mapping the 
region. Um, it's by Abraham Altelius, who, who was a Flemish uh, cartographer. And um, as you can see uh, from, the, from the cartouche um, over here, um, this is a map of, the, of, of East India, so to speak. And um, for, for this map, it's, it's significant because it's one of the earliest framings of, of the East Indies um, uh, as featured in Ortelius's Atlas, um, his, his theater of the world. And, um, and, and you can see how the East Indies, uh, so to speak, fits within that. It's a highly decorative uh, map. As was, uh, as was quite typical of the day. You have uh, pictures of, of sea monsters, for example, over here. Um, and, and lots of people have, have different ideas on, on why the sea monsters were there. Were they just purely decorative? Did they uh, signal a kind of uh, uh, a mystery? Um, are, are these, are these uh, areas that the map maker has no clue? Uh, um, uh, about what what resides there, and therefore you plonk a sea monster there. Perhaps a combination of of, of these things, but but sea monsters seem to um, uh, feature a lot, and and I think it tells us about how these were uh, really um, apart from geographic and cartographic uh, materials. They 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 were viewed um, as as works of art as well, and they, and they were decorative. And as we move on to to well th that that. That map, uh, uh, I, I should mention as well, it was first published in 1570 and um, it was reprinted um, over quite a few editions. It makes it very hard to date many of these, these maps, but it was, it was printed over a, a significant period from 1570 to about 1612. And um, usually map makers try to make uh, amendments and all. Um, Ortelius just, just uh, published this as it was uh, over that time period. Uh, but if we move closer to the turn of the, uh, of the 17th century, we have two maps that, that are currently on display um, at, the, at the exhibition. And um, they tell us something as well about this framing of the East Indies. Uh, the map that you see on the left was by Lin Shouten. And, and Lin Shouten was, uh, was a Dutchman um, who was under the employment of the, uh, of the Archbishop of Goa. Um, and, and Goa at that time of, was, of course, under Portuguese rule. And, and the Portuguese uh, were really the ones who had that deep knowledge of, of navigation of the region. Uh, so, so they were in, they were in Goa, uh, they were there since 1510, um, and soon after um, also uh, stamping their, their position in Malacca, closer to our shores. And, and this map that you see um, really shows, um, it's, it's really that first map to extensively use uh, Portuguese sources. And um, Lin Shouten had access to, to sailing records. He had access uh, um, to, uh, to first-hand information. He, he, he didn't uh, use his own, but, but he, he, had, he had access to that. And, and as a result, he was able to publish this map, uh, which... Uh, which was actually packaged together with uh, his, his book called The Itinerario, um, or a, a kind of itinerary of his travels to, uh, to this part of the world. And uh, one part of the itinerary was actually published slightly earlier in 1595 and, and, and was used by uh, the first Dutch voyage to the East Indies. And, and so, what you see here then is a map that not only served as, uh, uh, as, a, as a decorative uh, piece, um, you, you still have sea monsters, uh, just to mention, uh, but, but it, it was a map that, that actually uh, had a real impact, uh, in, in this case, on opening up Asia uh, to, to the Dutch. And, 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 and actually, um, you have this published in 1596, um, soon, af soon, uh, soon after that, in 1598, you have the, uh, an English edition being published, and, and that opens um, the, the book, um, his sailing directions, and, and the map um, to an English-speaking uh, audience as well. And, and um, it's, it's hard uh, not to see the connection uh, to a few years later at um, in 1600 and in 1602 with the establishment of both the English and the Dutch East India companies uh, set up primarily to take advantage of the, of the spice trade here. 
So, so there you have Lin Shelton's map on, on the left. Um, it, it still is a, a, a work in progress. Um, I'm not sure if you can recognize uh, much of Asia here, but um, this was a time when it still wasn't the convention to, um, to have north facing north. Um, so you could, you could orientate your map however you want it, just for, for, uh, for whatever looked best to you. Um, but if you, um, if, you, if you can see here, you have uh, China on the left, uh, which leads to the, the Malay Peninsula. Um, Singapore, of course, being uh, identified there. Um, I'm not sure if I can zoom in any further, uh, but, but Singapore uh, listed there right at the tip. Uh, of the Malay Peninsula. Um, I, re I remember bringing some, some visitors um, th through the exhibition and uh, one of my guests was Korean and, and, and she asked, oh, where's, where's Korea in all of this? And, and, and actually it is there. I, I, I pointed it out to her. It's, it's this um, Korea is uh, strangely depicted as a, as a round island. Um, and 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 we noticed there were some words at it, and we did a did a closer look. Island of thieves. It's like oh, okay, let's 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 move on, um, and and not talk too much. But but you see how how maps like these, um, you you expect them to be objective scientific documents, uh, but they um, they are filled with all sorts of um, of biases. Um, places where you didn't know very much about, or if you didn't really like the people, you call them thieves, pirates. Uh, however, and and who who is a pirate? I think that um, that's a that's a debate worth having over over many many groups of people. Um, Japan as well, um, in a very strangely uh, shrimp uh, shaped uh, coastline, as you see over here. What happened from that first uh, Dutch voyage uh, was, was actually the, the production of the map that you see on the right. Um, that's a map that, was, uh, that came out of, of one of the crew members of that first Dutch voyage to, to the East Indies. And um, that's an interesting map as well because that, that crew member, William Lodewijks, he published a book about his travels. Um, and uh, he intended to have this map included in that book. Um, but if you, if you find uh, a good copy of that book today, the first edition, um, you would notice that there is a missing page. And that missing page is actually uh, of this map. That, that, this map was taken out of that book. Um, and, um, and what happened was the Dutch merchants uh, found out about his plans to publish it and quickly forbade him from doing so. Um, so, so you see, you see how maps then were highly sought after uh, uh, things. You know, um, to have a map in your hands really means the ability to not only know how a place looked, but but perhaps actually to reach it and to and to get to that place. So, um, that's that's an interesting story on its own, but. But one of the main reasons why we have that in the exhibition and why I want to show that to you today is how um, I think this map that you see on the right by published eventually, nothing stays forbidden or, uh, for, for long. It was, it was taken by, by a German publisher, Theodore de Brie, and, and, and he managed to get his hands on one of the few um, original maps that were printed out and, 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 he, and he produced his own, which you see over here on the right. One reason why I, I really wanted to show this is, um, is that this, I believe, is the, the first uh, really uh, large-scale, zoomed-in uh, framing of the East Indies. Um, you have uh, the Malay Peninsula um, on, let me find my laser pointer again, the Malay Peninsula on the top with Sumatra um, and, and Java over here. And... Um, and, and so that gives us a sense, uh, again, uh, of not just uh, what constitutes the East Indies, but, but, but why such a region was so important. This was uh, the location, uh, uh, this was the gateway uh, to what was known as the Spice Islands. And um, 
if you if you're again following the story about the Portuguese presence at that time, the Portuguese um, had already established their presence along the Straits of Malacca, which you see here, and the Straits of Singapore, um, uh, which was really quite a thoroughfare. Um, but um, but the first Dutch voyage, they, they took their cue from, from Lin Shouten, who suggested, hey, why don't you sail through this passageway instead, the Sunda Straits? And, and hence, you have actually the, um, the ships, the Dutch ships, being depicted here, as you see, um, passing through not the Straits of Malacca uh, or the Straits of Singapore, but, but rather the Straits uh, of Sunda. Um, which are which is the narrow passageway uh, in between Sumatra and Java, and um, a bit more treacherous. Uh, but if you can avoid um, uh, the Portuguese, that that makes sense. And and as history would have it, soon after the Dutch would establish their administrative capital of the East Indies uh, in. Uh, in Jakarta, uh, well, what is Jakarta today, and or what they called uh, Batavia back then in 1619, um, just over 400 years ago, and that's located um, just about at the Sunda Straits as well. I mentioned the establishment of the East India companies, and uh, the with the companies being established. Um, in the 17th century, you see maps being produced for the companies. And in fact, if you if you are tracing the kinds of maps that were produced, you see an increasing standardization of the, the framing of the East Indies uh, or, or of Asia. And then here you see two very, very similar maps by two rival map makers. Uh, Blau, which you see on the left, Blau was actually the official uh, hydrographer of, of the East India Company, uh, and Hondius, uh, who you see on the right, both produced in the, in the 1630s. And uh, quite fun, again, if you, if you were to zoom in and have a look at the cartouches, um, Blau's, Blau's map is, is dedicated actually to, um, to Lawrence Rail, who, who was the governor general of the, East, uh, of the Dutch East Indies at that time. Um, whereas Hondius's map is, is dedicated to, to uh, a certain wealthy merchant instead. He, he didn't quite have that connection to, to the companies. Uh, but I guess my, my point here is how you have an increasingly standardized view um, of, of the East Indies. Um, and of course, it, it, it changes. Just now you had a mo much more in-depth one. Uh, now you, you, you zoom out and it, it's never really clear exactly what the East Indies was. But speaking of zooming in, this was definitely one important part of the East Indies. Um, this is a map of the Malukas, or, or what is Maluku today. Um, and if you always hear uh, the term Spice Islands, this, these uh, are uh, and, and were the Spice Islands that we're talking about. And, and for the, the English and the Dutch, and especially the Dutch, um, there was that uh, desire to to reach the source. Um, spices like nutmeg and clove were so uh, were already available in the international market. You could get them uh, from from Venice, or you could get them from the Middle East, uh, but at extremely high prices. These were spices that were worth their weight in gold. Uh, but but here, if you were able to reach the source, um, then you were you know you could you could reap the benefits of of, of that trade. So so here you. Have have um, uh, Blau's map of the of the Malukas. Blau actually uh, managed to buy over Hondius's map. Um, so again, all sorts of things taking place, acquisitions. Um, but what's interesting about this map is how detailed it is. You you see here uh, one of the maps, uh, uh, one of the islands, Bakian, and and you have an indication of in red the Dutch fortifications that were uh, established on the islands. Um, and you see that repeated again uh, with, the other, with the other islands, uh, the locations of the plantations. And uh, apart from that, um, I can't remember if you can still find sea monsters. Yes, you can. Um, but apart from sea monsters, uh, the, the map maker was very um, interested in depicting 
in, in depicting uh, shipping as well. And, and you see various examples of European merchant ships, what they call the East Indiamen, and, um, and also local vessels. And you can see them engaged in some forms of, of dueling as well, some battles, um, such as the, uh, the scene that you see right on top. And um, at the same time, you have some attempt at uh, over here depicting how the locals looked. I very much doubt they look like that. The cartouches, um, whenever I talk about uh, cartouches, these are um, uh, the ones that I'm talking about. The cartouches are, are extremely revealing, and here I've just chosen to, um, to, to show you the detail of one from, uh, from one of the other maps of the East Indies by, by Nicholas uh, Vischer. And, and this is a highly decorative cartouche, which, uh, which seeks to, to illustrate um, and, and use all sorts of symbols to, to depict the, the East Indies. Um, you have a tropical landscape in the background, palm trees, you can't go wrong with palm trees in, in showing the East Indies. Uh, but you see all uh, different groups of, uh, of Asians and uh, a whole array of, of different types of trading goods as well um, uh, that are peppered all, all across, um, including um, animals too. You have monkeys um, in front. It's, it's, a, it's a basically a bustling marketplace of goods. And that's, that's the view of the East Indies again, um, the riches of the, in, of the Indies, the kinds of, of goods that you are able to, to buy. So it's again viewed from, from that lens, uh, a commercial one. So I hope this gives you a, a, a taste, I guess, uh, of how uh, the East Indies were mapped and uh, the way such maps uh, tried to, to depict uh, the region. And, and from here, I, I, I thought to, to move on to look at travel literature because travel literature is so interesting from that period. Um, you didn't, of course, have the kind of mobility uh, that, that, that we enjoy today. And, and, and lots of people relied on, on travel books, travelogues, uh, to, to get a sense uh, of the world. And uh, with, with print technology, with engravings, um, people get a, a, an even stronger sense of how places and how people uh, looked. Um, I mentioned Lin Shouten at the start, and, and his itinerario also contained lots of illustration, uh, apart from, from descriptions and, and, and shipping instructions and all. And, and one of uh, the, uh, the, the images I, I, I find to be extremely interesting, because I think it shows you how uh, the production of images is very much uh, influenced, uh, shaped, by the, the kind of stereotypes held uh, by the artist. And in this case, um, you have uh, two pairs of figures, um, the Malays that you see on the left and the Javanese who, who you see on the right. And, and Lin Shouten goes on to provide a, 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 a written account uh, comparing the two. He, he, he seems to be rather fond of the Malays. He, he regards them um, as, as being very good, uh, uh, very good in, with their speech, very polite, very friendly. Um, and the Javanese he regards as hard-headed and, and, and stubborn and obstinate. Um, so he, I, I'm not sure who rubbed them off the, uh, off the wrong way. Um, actually, in, in all likelihood, um, he, he, he actually stayed in Goa for, for most of his time. I don't think, uh, I haven't found any record of him going to, to uh, Malacca or going to Java. Um, his information is likely to have been secondhand uh, from the various travelers who, who came to Goa and uh, from, from stories that he heard from them. Uh, regardless, these stories, uh, how, however he got his information, uh, these uh, ideas seem to be quite entrenched, and and they come out um, in 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 these uh, in these depictions as well. Um, and and this was really a period in which you have this uh, European obsession with ranking civilizations, who's who's higher um, in that hierarchy and who's lower. And one one way of uh, of uh, one indicator, I would say. 
uh, would be your relative state of dress or undress. Um, the Javanese are wearing relatively less clothes, I would say. Over here, they're shown slight, to be slightly more barbaric um, in uh, not just their dress, but as, uh, as well as their pose. It looks slightly less refined. Um, whereas the, the Malays are shown to be... Um, nicer people I guess um, so so again you would you would look at this and and try to to think um, what is behind an image like that how uh, to what extent would would such depictions or, or, or did such depictions reflect uh, reality and and here you have uh, lots of missing information we don't have um, the original sketches, for example, if there were original sketches made uh, by Lynn Shelton or anyone else who, who actually was there. Um, even if you had original sketches, how would that have been uh, translated, um, converted into print? Uh, you would have an engraver uh, who would produce an engraving like this, who almost definitely wouldn't have traveled to Asia. And, and he would be, in this case, uh, interpreting uh, the sketch, um, whether uh, uh, deliberately or not shaping it for, for a European audience. Um, so, so you have all sorts of, of things at play in, in the production of such images. Um, you have Newhoff, um, who, who, was, uh, who was actually um, under the employment of the Dutch East India Company. He, he, he arrived, um, he joined the, the, the Dutch East India Company or the VOC in the middle of the 17th century. He traveled um, to, to Batavia um, and, and I think they, they realized he was a rather good draftsman. So, so he got um, chosen to, to, to go on, uh, on, a, uh, on an embassy mission to, to China um, and uh, he, he, he ended up going there and, and, and sketched and, and produced lots of artwork related to that trip to China. Um, that trip was a failure, don't talk about it anymore, but, um, but the book uh, that he produced uh, became a kind of success and uh, it, it, it uh, ended up influencing an entire movement into chinoiserie, this whole uh, uh, fascination and obsession with, with Chinese aesthetics, um, so to speak. Um, but he, he also published other books, and, and in particular, he published a book, um, well, this was, published, uh, this was published after he died, actually, uh, but based on his accounts, on, on, the, on his voyages and travels to the East Indies. And accompanying those accounts uh, are, are, some, uh, are some depictions of the people groups who, who lived in Batavia. He was, he was based in Batavia, uh, or Jakarta today, um, for, for much of his time. Um, actually, his, his last few years in Batavia weren't so, weren't so happy. He was, uh, he was accused of under-declaring his, uh, um, his, his records and... Um, he ended up being arrested and then he was put under arrest in, in Batavia for a few years. Um, but, but that meant he had lots of time spent there. And uh, during his time of arrest especially, I think he had lots of time to, to draw and, and, to, uh, and, and, and to remember his time there. And, and, and these are some of the depictions of the various people, uh, uh, the various communities in, in Batavia. And, it, and it's interesting because they are uh, somewhat accurate, I would say. He, he was very fascinated with uh, mixed groups. The, uh, the pair that you see on the right, for example, um, he calls them the Mardaikas or the Topazes. Uh, they were, um, I guess, what you would refer to quite loosely as, as Eurasians today. And uh, he, he, he noted how many of them, uh, at least the men, uh, would dress somewhat um, in, in the Dutch fashion, but the women uh, would dress a little bit more uh, in, in native dress. So, but the question uh, uh, again uh, remains how, how accurate uh, such, such depictions were. Um, some people have suggested that the, that the depiction of textiles, for example, are quite accurate, actually. 
Uh, but yet at the same time, the way that they are engraved, um, the clothes seem to flow down a little bit more like Roman togas uh, rather than um, how, how your sarongs or your kabayas would, would, would look. Um, and the poses, again, that the, uh, that the figures are, are, are showing uh, look, again, more, more European. This was something fun. Um, what you see on the left um, is, is from Newhoff, and, and that's his depiction of, uh, uh, of a Javanese couple, a Javanese man and woman. So, so that's them over here. And uh, I've, I've been very fascinated with how this image uh, seems to be copied a lot by other printmakers um, in the uh, roughly a century uh, following the, the publication of this original print on the left. And uh, you see um, the print on the right over here. Uh, someone seems to have just inverted um, the, uh, the print, um, added some things, um, but... Um, and and in the next one, over here, um, given the um, given the couple a bit more space, added some fencing around their garden, um, but it, and and in particular, I f I find that the guy seems to stay the same, um, and that sort of. Uh, uh, when you look at Newhoff's own written account, he 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 actually writes about Javanese men. Oops, sorry. He writes about the Javanese men being mostly naked, except for for uh, what they wrap around their waist and uh, and and their headgear. So so that seems to be quite faithfully kept too. He he doesn't say anything about the women, interestingly. And uh, in this case, you see the women, the 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 woman in the in the prince starting to look more and more European. She looks quite Dutch. Um, by the time you reach this image here. Um, not very recognizable from the original. I'll share one more, and, and this is um, another travel series uh, by Francois Valentin. And Valentin produced this um, huge uh, series of, of books, uh, volumes called The Old and New East Indies. And, and Valentin was uh, a Dutch minister who was uh, who was posted uh, to Ambon, and he spent a lot of his time there. And um, through through his experience um, being there, he he published his accounts um, lavishly illustrated, and and this and and this series of of volumes really shaped uh, uh, the European understanding and and view of the East Indies for for much of the of the 18th century. These were published between 1724 and 1726. Um, I've I've been very interested in how he presents himself. So you see uh, Valentin's portrait on the left. Um, let's try and zoom in a little bit to see him. Um, the medallion, as you see here, um, is held by two women. You have uh, what looks like the Roman goddess Minerva, the goddess of, of war and, and of uh, many things. It's it, it looks like Athena as well, um, of war, of commerce, of 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 wisdom, of art, um, and you have um, over here on the on the top left um, another woman, um, and that seems to represent faith, uh, faith personified. Um, I'm not sure how well you can see from your from the screen here. She has a very tiny church um, on her head. I wish I could. Uh, zoom in a bit more. She has a tiny church on her head, and there's an even tinier dove um, sitting atop that church, <laughs> um, which is of course glowing. Um, so, you you have this uh, this depiction of of Valentin um, representing his religious faith as a minister, um, but also his uh, his quest. For, for knowledge, for, for commerce, for, uh, for, for the arts. And, and that's also shown in the various uh, um, Asians who, 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 who surround uh, this medallion and, and there's this seemingly pers seeming pursuit uh, of, of knowledge. And this is 
very interesting as well. If we are to look at the frontispiece of his book, um, that's what you see on the right over here. And in one frontispiece, um, you have uh, dozens uh, of, uh, of, of allegories. You have right at the center of uh, the picture here, you have a woman and, and she wears a necklace that says VOC. So this is the, the Dutch East India Company or the VOC personified as a woman. She is seated right at the center on a throne with a crown. Um, she's a queen and, sh and she is right at the center of this picture. And what you see around her um, are really representatives of the four continents paying tribute to her. At her, at her, at her feet um, on the right, um, you see, uh, you see uh, America as a woman. She's wearing a headdress and she's presenting some pearls to, uh, to, to the VOC. And uh, if you look um, to the left, you see an Asian pair uh, wearing turbans, and and they have a variety of uh, of uh, a chest of jewelry. The man holds a a chest of jewelry on his lap, um, and and the woman uh, she's holding an incense burner uh, as well. So so these are Asia's offerings uh, to the VOC. Uh, you have Africa being represented on the far left on top. And uh, Africa is, is shown as a man wearing a grass skirt, um, holding uh, elephant tusks, uh, a symbol of the ivory trade. And uh, on top, you will see, uh, again, Minerva, the Roman goddess representing Europe. Europe doesn't really need to pay tribute. She, she just stands there. Um, you have uh, agriculture. Uh, being being represented by by the man um, holding the plow right next to Minerva, um, you have the personification of truth. That's the lady on the right um, who unveils the curtain, revealing the truth. And and what what lies beneath the uh, beyond the curtain? Um, on the right, you see uh, a scene of the land trade. You have uh, camels and a caravan. Um, and on the left, on the top left, you see uh, a scene of the sea trade uh, of a Dutch East Indiaman uh, out at sea. And if we were to go a bit lower, uh, over here you have uh, all these cherubs um, actually being very interested in, um, in their studies. They are holding books uh, related to history. They are, um, the cherub um, seated um, in front is, has his hands uh, on, on a map. Um, you, you see another two, two cherubs behind um, opening a, a chest of drawers, taking out some shells. And, and Valentin was, was very interested in shells and tried to document all of that in his, uh, in his book as well. Um, and, and next to the chest, you see, uh, you see a, a lady, an angel perhaps, uh, writing something. And uh, if, you, if you zoom in even further, you would see that uh, a Bible verse is, is being uh, written out uh, by that. And, and that's, uh, that's actually a, a verse from the book of Psalms, um, Psalm 107 verses 23 and 24. And I'll read that out to you. Some went down to the sea in ships, doing business on the great waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord his wondrous works in the deep. Hmm. Okay, so so there you have um, in one in one uh, frontispiece uh, everything that that Valentin uh, I guess wanted to achieve uh, using his book. I didn't mention that creepy guy looking on uh, on on the right. Um, that's most probably a depiction of a Dutch minister, um, and might be Valentin himself uh, inserted into into this image. And, and what did he illustrate in his book? 
you have on the left an example, uh, various Dutch fortifications in Ambon. I mentioned he was based in Ambon, so he would have been quite familiar with, with what was there in Ambon. Uh, I was very struck by this, uh, by how all the various forts were named. They were named Fort Amsterdam, Fort Rotterdam, Fort Middleburg. Um, you, you see all aspects of Holland being stamped um, on Ambon. Um, one thing I didn't get to show in the exhibition is the page on the right. Um, and, and that's uh, a page that shows a mermaid, actually. Um, and uh, the mermaid is actually shown alongside other known fish species. You see a sawfish, a catfish, a carp, um, and all. And Valentin actually claims that a mermaid was caught. Uh, on the coast of Borneo, and, and in fact, he also goes on to claim that he saw one himself. Um, but um, again, who knows whether he did or not. Some people have suggested he might have been referring instead to the dugong. Uh, and the, the dugong um, has been referred to um, as the, the lady of the sea, in, in, in a way. So, so the, was he actually referring to a dugong instead? Um, how how uh, this, this idea of the mermaid uh, was, was actually quite a, a popular one, and how did that creep into, um, into his book? How did that end up as part of that imagination of, of the East Indies? Um, well, for one, Valentin was known to have plagiarized quite heavily and, and taken lots of different sources uh, from everywhere and not really crediting them. Um, who knows? Um, this, one, this one looks like it was taken from, from another print, actually, uh, which I've seen before. In the exhibition, you uh, see... Um, images of two slaves and I thought to at this point talk about that uh, that depiction of slavery you have um, you have on the left uh, a slave called Ali and 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 this is a drawing of of class Frederick Hornsted um, Hornsted was a, a Swedish naturalist who who uh, who arrived in Java in the 1780s and he did what most of his contemporaries uh, would have done by a slave, and and um, he found his slave's name to be long and unpronounceable, so he changes his name to Ali, um, something that he could handle, I guess, and Ali uh, ends up being depicted here, um, actually uh, helping him uh, prepare his specimens. So if you, you look a little bit closer, Ali is um, holding holding a specimen for him and 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 in the exhibition we we present this this drawing as a as a way in which uh, we uh, as as a means of of questioning how scientific knowledge in the east indies uh, relied very much on local knowledge uh, local expertise and 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 here in one drawing you see the uh, the relationship between the two I, I thought to show this here because both this drawing and the subsequent two uh, that you see on the right um, really show um, slaves in East in the East Indies sort of taken out of their context and and then uh, made to do different things. In the case of Ali, um, we know from uh, from Hornsted's accounts that Ali's main job was actually to run in front of his carriage to clear the way. Um, and, uh, and here, in, in this case, he's sort of taken out and planted here to, to become his, uh, his collecting uh, assistant. Um, for, for the boy in the center that you see here, this was uh, a boy from Papua who, who ended up uh, in the slave trade in Bali. Uh, we don't know exactly how he ended up there, uh, but in the 1810s, um, he uh, ended up being purchased by Raffles. And, and Raffles brings him uh, to England. Uh, you know the story as well. He has his name changed to Dick. And, and Dick uh, goes to England and becomes a kind of sensation where... where 
people uh, there had never seen someone like him before. People come to, to look at him uh, as a kind of curiosity. Um, and this was really a period uh, of, of racial uh, ideologies and, and, uh, and where uh, physiognomy was, was used in, 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 in ranking the races as well. So what you see on the right is actually a print in Raffles' own history of Java of the very same boy. And, and, and in that in, in, in that print, you see uh, the boy being depicted uh, in a, a lot more objectifying uh, uh, position. And, and this is actually used to accompany uh, uh, a physical description that was provided for by Raffles's friend, the surgeon uh, Sir Everett Holm, who, who actually described, who, who attempts a, a description of the boy uh, comparing him to what he referred to as the African Negro. Uh, so so that, that was how the slave was, was, was treated uh, in a way. Uh, but I'm interested in how uh, you have two images here of the same boy, and, and, and he is depicted uh, in quite a different way uh, on the left. And, and on the left, apart from being subjected to, to that physical examination by, by the London surgeon, Dick also gets his portrait done uh, by Thomas Phillips of the Royal Academy. And, and Phillips decides to, uh, to give this portrait uh, a bit more of a romantic uh, treatment. And, and so here you have two, two different uh, portraits of Dick. Uh, but what they hold in common, actually, is um, this idealized, um, constructed uh, tropical scene of the East Indies. Again, um, you can't go wrong, like I mentioned, with planting a couple of palm trees uh, in the background. These, these were images that were produced entirely in London. Uh, so um, they, in that sense, would have been entirely fabricated landscapes, uh, but to, to, to give you a sense. Uh, of the East Indies and, and, and to give you a sense, I guess, of uh, authenticity. Expeditions and explorations. Um, I, I, I will go on to talk about how the East Indies were, uh, or the view of the Indies were, were very much shaped through different expeditions, especially scientific ones. Um, the image that you see here um, was, was produced as part of, uh, of Captain James Cook's uh, third and final voyage to, to the Pacific. And, and this is an image of Krakatau, um, very, one of the very v rare views of the, of the island um, just before, uh, well, not just before, but before the, the eruption that, that obliterated most of the island in, in 1883. And, and this was done by, uh, by John Weber, who, who was the official artist uh, on that voyage. So I've, I've, I've attached the, uh, a quote here from, from Cook himself uh, talking about how um, his job, Weber's job, uh, was to supply uh, the unavoidable imperfections of written accounts uh, uh, well, of, uh, by enabling us to preserve and bring home drawings of the most memorable scenes. So you have the perfection, imperfections of the written account, uh, but with his drawing, something that is more uh, authentic. Um, again, how, how authentic would, would that be? Um, a scene like this would be what we would have considered an extremely picturesque scene, and I will go on to, to talk about that um, in, in this slide over here. Um, if you've been to the exhibition, you would recognize the scene on the right. Um, and, and that's a scene that is supposedly of Raffles' riding party crossing the river Chidami at the foot of Gunung Salak in, in Java. Um, but the origin of that, of that work is actually the sketch that you see on the left. Um, what you see on the left um, was was sketched by Mary Fendel in 1816. Mary Fendel was the was the daughter of John Fendel, um, who who actually came and took over from Raffles as Lieutenant Governor in Java in 1816. So I'm assuming his daughter had no choice but to follow him. Had lots of free time and did a couple of sketches, and that's what you that's what you have on the left. Curiously, this sketch has a pencil inscription on the reverse saying riding party, six to seven miles. Um, 
on the on on this original sketch on the left, you see no riding party at all, and and later on in Lady Raffles's memoir of the life and public services of of Sir Stamford Raffles, the the print uh, produced by William Daniel is actually based on this on this drawing on the left, and it resembles a lot more um, the image that you see on the right, and and what. Essentially, uh, what what looks like uh, what happened uh, was Daniel well, that that pencil inscription of writing party was probably an instruction to Daniel to hey can you add a writing party over here um, he obliges and can you beautify this scene can you make it picturesque and and so you see the the mountain Gulang Salak is um, the original is has is slightly uh, formless um, the the mountain on the right is made to look uh, sharper and and more triumphant even um, you have uh, a much more nicely sculpted uh, foliage on on both sides of the river as well and and so this this was the job of the engraver of of in this case William Daniel in in taking an original sketch and turning it into something picturesque and 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 I want to talk about the picturesque because the picturesque was was really um, this this artistic uh, 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 preference uh, mainly of, of the of the British public at that time that preference for the depiction of nature as it was as it was just there unspoiled rugged untouched by by human intervention uh, but yet ironically um, that that desire for such a picturesque image uh, was made possible only by your artist and your engraver shifting things around to make it look pleasing. Um, so not so natural, um, come to think of it. And that was, I mentioned William Daniel earlier. William Daniel actually traveled together with his uncle, Thomas. Um, um, you had, I mentioned earlier, official artists um, who, who followed these expeditions. In this case, he and his uncle uh, persuaded the East India Company to let them follow on a voyage. And uh, they painted what they saw and they produced an illustrated travel book, in this case uh, quite aptly called A Picturesque Voyage to India by Way of China. And uh, the, the quote that you see on the right is, is, is somewhat of their, of their uh, statement of intent, what they wanted to achieve with, 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 this, with this book. Um, and, and they uh, placed themselves among scientists, naturalists, philosophers who all try to aim at the truth in some way. Um, I'll read the last part. It remains for the artist to claim his part in these guiltless spoilations and to transport to Europe the picturesque beauties of these favoured regions. Um, so the artist too has certain uh, noble missions um, as part of this larger enlightenment project. And, and here you have various picturesque scenes. Um, what's interesting about uh, Daniel's uh, prints uh, is that they are all uh, accompanied with, with their own uh, uh, commentary. So, so I'll, I'll read some parts of that here. Um, in, in this case, you have a, a print showing the, the prahu, or what they call the proas. Um, the native uh, Malay vessel, and, and, and they go on to, to talk about how the construction of the Malay proas cannot but appear strange to the European eye. Uh, they go on to say um, how it's reflective not only of the infancy of navigation, but of society at large. And, and, and they, they go on to, to talk about how society in the East Indies uh, was in a kind of state of, uh, of stagnation, um, there is no development. Time seems to just keep rolling on uh, without anything happening. Uh, so, so that's their kind of stereotypical but idealized kind of view uh, of the East Indies as um, never changing and, and, and just being stuck in time. Um, you have more pictures of, of, the, uh, of the, the local vessels. I will 
um, go on and, and show some further examples of the malaise of Java, of a Malay village. And, and here, um, this was the image that we used right at the start. Um, and the malaise of, again, you have you remember Lin Shouten comparing his uh, malaise and, 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 and the Javanese and, and trying to find the differences. Um, in, this, in this case, the, the Daniels try to look at the similarities between the Malays and the Javanese and, 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 and they argue that they are equally prone to idleness and, and mischief, to, to sloth and to sensuality, yet are capable of being roused by the hope of profit to occasional efforts of industry and activity. Um, you see that reflected in the, in, in the print on the, on the left. Um, you have in the foreground uh, uh, a, a, few, a few Malays who are lounging, um, not really involved in any uh, um, kind of work. Um, it seems that they are involved perhaps in, in cockfighting or some kind of gaming. Um, you have uh, some scene of, of industry in the background, uh, but, but it's, it's really to show that's, you know, once in a while that happens, but for most part the Malays are just whiling their time away, being idle. And, and, and that comes out um, both in the image um, and in their text. I'll come to the last part, and I realize I'm, I'm running a little bit out of time. Um, to the last part of, of this presentation, I thought to, to look at how Singapore uh, then gets, uh, gets depicted. Um, this is, a, this is a print that you see on display in the exhibition, a nice panoramic view uh, of Singapore uh, from, taken from what was then known as Government Hill or what is Fort Canning Hill today. And, and here it, it conforms again to, to, to that template uh, of the picturesque, especially if you look at the trees on the right, it, they're added there for, uh, for composition. Uh, but this isn't a, a scene of unspoiled nature. Uh, you have development uh, of, of the town taking place at the foot uh, of, of Fort Canning. And, and further, further in the background, uh, you see uh, a very, very busy shipping scene um, at the Singapore Harbour. So you, you have a, a kind of adaptation of that, of that picturesque composition, but then um, used and adapted for, for depicting Singapore, because on one hand, it is part of the tropics, you want to show that, uh, that element uh, of, of where Singapore is, uh, but at the same time, you want to show uh, scenes of development, how how the port in particular is uh, is is growing and is busy. Um, here are some other examples. Um, in this case, um, this was uh, a print based on uh, uh, on on an artwork by Louis Le Breton uh, from the the French ship the Astrolabe um, that that actually stopped by in Singapore for for six days in in eighteen thirty nine. So again, um, and. I, I show this to show how that view from a top government hill uh, was that favoured um, vantage uh, for, for depicting Singapore. Some of you might be familiar with this painting in our collection, um, one of our more famous paintings, a view of Singapore from Mount Wallach uh, by Percy Carpenter. And, and this is a view, uh, again, uh, I would argue a rather picturesque view, uh, one of the largest and widest panoramic views of, of Singapore uh, done in the 19th century. And uh, again, conforming to, to, that, to that ideal. And... Um, and here, of course, this is by this time you are in the middle of the 19th century. Singapore is hugely developed, as you can see uh, over here. Uh, but at the same time, lots, lots of greenery that still exists and which the, the artist Carpenter uh, emphasizes. This view from Mount Wallach, um, or where Tanjong Paga is today, um, is uh, again one of these templates uh, that keeps getting repeated over and over again. In fact, this isn't the first time such a view was done. More than 20 years before that, um, well, uh, just under 20 years before that, you have a view very, very similar uh, to that, also from Mount Wallach, 
by another traveling artist, Jacob Jansen. Um, it was a Prussian-born artist who, who, who stopped by in Singapore in 1837 and 1838. Um, again, um, showing uh, that, that view of Singapore from atop uh, Mount Wallach. So I'm not sure whether Carpenter would have seen such seen this view before and 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 based his 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 painting on that. Um, as Vidya mentioned, I I do like photography and I just had to squeeze a photograph in here, um, a view from around the same spot. Uh, this time Mount Erskine, the mount uh the hill just uh to the left, and again you you see um in this case the camera doesn't lie or does it. Actually, it does, but um, but you see, it's actually a lot harder to to compose that that picturesque uh, landscape, um, and and in this case, uh, you only see some some uh, of the vegetation uh, on on the left. I'll breeze through the rest, um, and 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 this is just a point that that shows you how certain images get uh, repeated and and reinterpreted over and over again. Um, apart from views from atop uh, the hills, you have very, very popular scenes of the mouth of the Singapore River itself. And you see that um, in the original view on the left, uh, which was uh, actually done as part of yet another French expedition um, around the world, which, which landed in, in Singapore for five days in, in 1830 in the La Favorite. And, and, and this became a, a view that gets copied by different uh, printmakers, adding, adding more and more people just to emphasize even more how busy and uh, Singapore is, adding more more boats, uh, taking lots of liberties uh, with, with how the, the mouth of the Singapore would have been. And I thought to end uh, my talk today, thank you, I, I, I know I think I uh, exceeded the time a little, but I, I, I thought to end, since we're talking about imagination, how Singapore gets imagined along the way in, in various kinds of artwork. Um, the, the postcard that you see on the left is actually based on a slightly earlier print, uh, which was in turn based on, a, on an artwork by, by Woodville. And and this postcard is actually titled. It, it was uh, it was published um, in the early twentieth century, around nineteen eleven, if I'm not wrong. And and it's actually titled "The British Army Entering Singapore After Its Session in 1824." Um, what looks to me like a totally imagined scene um, of, if you zoom in again, that shows. Uh, who is supposed to be a kind of of what is supposed to be a kind of military um, entrance into Singapore by the British? That that wasn't really the case. You have a carriage here showing both a kind of British general or, or governor alongside uh, a local ruler. Would this be the Sultan himself? Who knows? Uh, but again, you have here an entirely fabricated scene of the British arrival in Singapore. And, and, and that was part of a postcard series um, that, that's titled The Growth of Our Empire Beyond the Seas. Hmm. Um, the image that you see on the right, um, yet another totally fabricated scene of Singapore, um, resembling a, a lot more uh, perhaps a, a port scene in the Middle East rather than in Singapore itself. Um, this is one of the mysteries I, I, I have in our collection. I have no idea um, how this print was produced and what was the context of it. Um, if any one of... I, I, I thought to end on this note on what I don't know. Um, and if any of you have come across this print before and, and, and you know how this came about, I would love to speak to you. Um, it, uh, it's, it's a huge mystery to me. But, but I think uh, on, on that note, I, uh, this is really... Uh, uh, I would say far from a comprehensive look at how the East Indies and in turn Singapore was, was framed um, and in turn imagined uh, through artwork. But I hope uh, you get uh, some sense uh, of that, uh, some of the 
backstories, I guess, to, to, to the artwork that you see in the exhibition. And as Vidya mentioned, if you haven't seen the exhibition yet, uh, I hope you do find the time to see it. Um, and with that, I, I really thank you for your time today. Um, I'll be happy to... Do we have time for, for some questions? Uh, I'll be happy to, to take uh, your questions now. Thank you. And in the meantime, I'll just flash our uh, QR code. Um, definitely appreciate if you could uh, share your feedback with us. And of course, any questions. Yes. I, how much uh, documentation of that era is there from Asian sources, either written or 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 drawings? And um, how did that how did that relate to the European accounts? Mm. Um, we have written accounts, uh, but much less in terms of of visual depictions. So, so you're asking about um, Asian uh, accounts and depictions of Europe. Uh, we have definitely written accounts, and and if if we're Sorry? Um, oh, okay. So you're talking about Asian accounts of, uh, of, of Asia itself. Yeah. Um, again, I would say we have lots of, of written accounts. Definitely not as much as the Europeans, uh, but you have that. Uh, but um, hardly any of, uh, of, of, local, of local artists uh, drawing. So, so that's, that's really one of the, uh, the limitations that we had to deal with in, in putting that, this exhibition together, um, where especially if you're looking at visual sources and, and artwork, um, a large majority of, of what is available is, is European. And, and so what we decided to, to do was to actually present that as it is, but, but, but then to start poking holes and, and to, and to uh, question the, the, the authenticity, to, to question the, the ways in which um, certain uh, uh, racial, for example, ideologies shaped the, the way such, such images were presented. Yes. Um, <laughs> so now I forgot my question. Um, yes, what was the, uh, we can understand what the, the purpose of the mapping uh, was, but what was the, the primary purposes of the, the depictions? Mm -hmm. Um, in so, if you're looking at because uh, the the maps obviously help develop trade. Mm -hmm. um, why why do you believe these artists started creating these drawings? Mm. These that? these were very much decorative maps, and uh, uh, what I don't uh, show uh, in in this uh, in in this presentation are how uh, are the production of of hydrographic charts or sea charts, which which tended to be a lot more uh, working documents actually brought on board ships, and and those tended to almost have no decoration uh, whatsoever. They they were serious documents. Not to say these weren't serious, but but these were. Um, these maps were uh, produced with a very different uh, customer base in mind. These were uh, to be consumed in Europe uh, by by people who who saw themselves as as learned, and and then these uh, were um, either kept um, in terms as 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 atlases or or displayed um, as as decorative pieces. So so the the role of artwork then. Um, was really to to beautify to make the map actually look attractive, um, and and while they while they were at it, then um, the 
images and symbols related to the to the East Indies were highly sought after. They were exotic scenes. They were uh, of 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 curious looking peoples and and curious looking things that 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 would not have been familiar in Europe. And and these were things that that were then sought after as nice to uh, have and to own and to display. Uh, good evening. I have Hi. um two questions. Um, first question is um compared to after obtaining the Lin Lin map, mm -hmm. the Dutch actually uses the Sunda Straits, mm -hmm. while the English James mm -hmm. Lancaster he uses mm -hmm. the Malacca Strait. What was the rationale, um, to actually for Lancaster to use the Malacca Strait since he knows that the Portuguese are in Malacca. Mm -hmm. And my second question is the the breeze map. Um, it's made, but it's published by Germans. So, mm -hmm. to what extent is that were Germans, are uh, probably more privately involved in the enterprise of Dutch East India Company and British East India Company? Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Um, the first question about the Straits of Malacca versus the Sunda Straits. Um, at that point, it was still um, what what I mentioned to you of of avoiding the Portuguese was one consideration. Uh, but I think if you're looking at navigation in general, um, there were advantages to both routes. Um, the the use of the Straits of Malacca and the Straits of Singapore that was uh, a more straightforward route, uh, less treacherous, and in fact a lot more sheltered as well. So so that's viewed to be a safer route. The Straits of Sunda uh, was viewed to be a bit more treacherous. You had to have a good uh, sense uh, of the strait and how to navigate it. Um, there was a lot more open water that you were that you were exposed to and 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 with that a lot more risks uh, but uh, again if you're looking at the monsoons the Sunda Strait uh, was more versatile and it could be used um, almost through the year um, whereas the 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 Straits of Malacca had a more limited uh, time period for for its usage so uh, there were many different factors at play um, but I'm uh, I'm I'm not sure specifically um, how the decision making process would have uh, would have gone. But but I'm sure these would have been uh, taken into consideration. Uh, Debris uh, was was really a commercial publisher. Um, this this map. Uh, was was part uh, of of his Petit Voyages um, book, and um, this was really largely a commercial enterprise. He he, um, the publisher would find uh, sources from all over the world uh, and try to compile them um, in in uh, in a single volume that would be appealing again to 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 a European clientele. So. Uh, there is no in this in this case uh, no direct connection to the companies, uh, but more uh, in this case you would see, I would see this as a publisher, uh, a German publisher who was extremely enterprising and and uh, and taking most advantage of what was available out there. Hi, thank you for the presentation. Um, okay, you have shown how. Uh, um, these different impressions of Asia mm. uh, by Europeans, uh, kind of like uh, they are getting, uh, they're more like deviating further and further <laughs> from well, what is actually mm. on the ground, mm. and probably they are more a reflection of uh, European beliefs. Mm. Okay, so my question would be, um, how seriously do you think Europeans at that time took these images? Um, mm -hmm. Do they use them as you know? Do they think that these really reflected? You know, for those Europeans who never traveled out of Europe, for example, mm. do they take them as you know these really reflected what the people were like on the other side of the world, or they just treated them as you know like pictures on the wall, mm. curiosities, things to embellish their drawing rooms, for example, mm. and and also um, how do you think this skewed um, um, later Europeans' uh, impressions of Asia? 
uh, and Asians as a whole, um, particularly towards the, the 19th century when you have, you know, the advent of uh, nationalism, ideas about race, and mm. so on and so forth. Mm. That's, a, that's a very good question. Um, I don't think I would be able to... Uh, have that full understanding uh, of how uh, such such literature and how such depictions would have been uh, taken in uh, at that time. But um, I would say that the the pursuit for authenticity um, is probably similar to uh, to to how we would uh, pursue it today. Um, people want to know, hey, what what is uh, Asia really like? And, uh, and, and so, uh, of course, you had all sorts of fantastical accounts uh, before that, but, but how these uh, pieces of, uh, these travelogues advertise themselves um, really was, was by emphasizing how the authors, for example, were really there. Um, it's not by a second or third or fourth hand account and, they, they, and they've copied it down. These were people who was really there. Uh, Lynn Shelton was really in Goa. Um, Newhoff was, was really in Batavia. Um, Valentin was, was really in Ambon. Um, so that was how it was advertised. And in many cases, the artwork that was produced... Um, uh, was was also advertised based on how close to to the actual events the the artist was. So, for example, Newhoff, uh, when he published his book on an embassy to China um, in sixteen sixty six, um, was it sixty five? Um, around there, um, he um, this was taken to be the very first um, accurate depiction of China because this guy really went there. Um, but uh, I, I don't have the image right now. If you look at the frontispiece of, of that book, um, it shows who is supposed to be the emperor of China. Um, doesn't look like him at all. Um, and for that matter, the, embassy, the Dutch embassy that Newhoff was, was a part of never got to meet the emperor. Um, so, so, so again, um, you, you still have all these inconsistencies. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, even if the artist was there, uh, it's not his actual sketches that gets reproduced. Um, the sketch is always uh, uh, interpreted uh, by, by the engraver. Who, who then um, uh, produces it uh, for for the reading public, uh, but uh, but I would say in general people people were still discerning in that sense, um, as far as they could be. <laughs> they tried to look out. Uh, I mean, they they valued accounts that were supposedly firsthand, uh, but even then. Uh, as we can see from from today, uh, that wasn't always reliable, and and we can't always count on them telling the truth. Uh, Valentin claimed everything to be his, but um, there were huge parts, especially of his natural history sections, that relied on another naturalist, uh, Rumphius, who was supp uh, supposed to be a good friend of his. I'm not sure how good a friend he was to Rumphius by lifting directly from much of Rumphius's own uh, writings and never ever crediting him. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, so, so it was prized, but uh, at the same time, um, I don't think all these uh, uh, writings and, and publishers were, were that honest either. Um, to your question about how that shaped um, views of, of uh, subsequent European views of, of, of Asians. Uh, I would say especially um, the, today we, we looked a lot at the, the views of the Malays and I think you have lots of different uh, 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 ways in which the Malays have been stereotyped but I, I would argue that artwork uh, such as that of, of the Daniels 
um, contributed at least in part uh, to to reinforcing that stereotype of the of the myth of the of the lazy native. Um, you would have other depictions of of Chinese. I I, I don't have that here as well, but many Euro European uh, depictions of the Chinese as uh, slit eyed, as looking cunning and uh, untrustable. Um, really went quite far into shaping European views of, of Chinese people as, as actually being such. Um, you have shown how uh, the narrative was formed um, through pictures and um, different people copied um, different things. Would that also lend authenticity? Because the more something is reproduced, the, the supposed authority of that mm. becomes um, instilled in people. Yes. So mm. it, it's a first-hand account, even though it's seen through a mm. European lens. So they may not understand a lot of what's going on, so they interpret it in such a way that they can place an understanding on it. Um, that's the first step. But as, it, as it's reproduced and reproduced and reproduced, that sort of becomes an authority, even when they may not be you know, trained in the area itself. Mm. Um, did you... So with that perpetuation, would that not then really um, shape Europeans' views of, of um, people in Southeast Asia or other places? For, for better or worse, I think it did. And uh, you see, uh, I, I guess we, are, we, we look at, at such works, both the written accounts and the, and the visual ones with uh, a modern day 21st century lens. And, and right away, you, you are able to, to look at that and, and critique it, um, critique its sources, to critique its authenticity. Um, and, and that's exactly the kind of exercise we're doing now. Um, back then, I guess, the, the conventions for simple things like citation uh, really weren't there. Um, you could really borrow and 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 reproduce and and there was a bit less of an issue i would say um you you didn't quite have those conventions so i i would say um that was in a in in part uh, a very different uh, paradigm and a very different way in which knowledge was uh, was recorded and and how knowledge was was disseminated. Um, I would say then uh, that uh, there was still that problem uh, of uh, a kind of broken telephone. Um, the the more times something gets reinterpreted, um, the the, the the higher the chance of 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 corruption, I guess, and uh, that's that's something that uh, you have to deal with as well. You have books like these, um, which like like the ones that I showed you, which are in a sense original books. Uh, these were by Lin Shouten or by Newhoff himself, um, but there were lots of pirate. Uh, pirated books as well and and many of these pirated books just took uh, from everywhere so so um, I suspect this for example um, the one on the right uh, was from a pirated book um, that uh, just took um, an original image it, it probably took from this actually which which actually took from this um, and uh, the pirated books, offered something that the originals didn't, um, just like a Greatest Hits compilation today that um, um, they took from all sources and, and, and they could publish uh, books that, that offered you um, pictures and accounts from all over the world, uh, for example. Um, there were many of those and, and you had um, uh, very, very... Uh, uh, established um, publishers in, in that area as well. Um, Van der Aar, for example, did lots of that. And uh, 
um, and and people appreciated the convenience, I guess, of having everything in one book. Um, so so yeah, do you buy um, your original album or the greatest hits? Uh, <laughs> I would argue there's a difference in in the eventual experience. Yeah. Thank you very much once again. Okay.